Never mind you don't uh, applaud for me, but at least for Scott <laughs> you should applaud. He flew especially. <laughs> Scott Spirit. Yes, Yossi Vardy. CDO of WPP. Correct. What are all these TLAs? The what? TLAs, three letters acronym. Well, you've got to, you've got to keep things complex. If it's too simple, people wonder what you're doing. So. Okay, so what is CDO? Chief Digital Officer. And what is WPP? WPP is uh, Wire and Plastic Products. Wire and Plastic Products, and this is the name of the largest ad agency Yeah, we in don't do world. a great job on when it comes to naming for ourselves. We do obviously a wonderful job on behalf of our clients. But no, uh, I think it's very, work very well for it's you an also. Old world company. We actually still own a small manufacturing company in England that makes um, wire baskets for when you're in the supermarket. We still uh, own that. That was the original company. And when are you planning to go at last uh, wireless? Wireless, yeah. Well. I guess metal prices are, are pretty low at the moment, so we can still afford to make the wire Good. baskets. Scott, uh, you are doing this job for? Uh, I've had this job for one year. For one year. Yeah. And uh, your job before that? Uh, oh, I still have that job as well, because at WPP, everyone has two jobs, because we're overhead. Give so you, do they give you two salaries? No, half a salary. So one salary for two jobs? Uh, yeah. Okay. So my uh, previous job, which I still have, was Chief Strategy Officer. But the two are pretty linked. Obviously, digital is a huge okay. part of that. Okay. And strategy. before these two? Before that, I was Martin Sorrell's assistant. Good. Yeah. Which and was an apprenticeship, a, a, a baptism of fire. And where are you located? I live here in Singapore. In Singapore. Yes. And how do you like it here in Singapore? I love it. I'll do my, uh, I don't know if anyone from the EDB is here, but I will do their job for them and tell everyone what a wonderful place it is to live, to work, no, um, the, the to pay tax. It's great. The truth, you told it to me off, off stage also. And uh, in Israel, when somebody say he likes to live in Israel, everybody applauds, you know, this. Well. These guys a little bit, we have to get them a little bit agitated. A bit timid. <laughs> There's good, no one good, from EDB good. here, obviously. <laughs> good, 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 good. It's three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, yeah. this is a very tough... It's a tough gig. It's a tough time to interview something at three o'clock in the It's better afternoon. than three o'clock in the morning. I didn't think about it, but you know, we, we people who are involved in, in, uh, in uh, conferences, we call this slot The graveyard slot, okay. because everybody falls asleep usually at this. All right, uh, well, as long as you don't fall asleep, then we're good. <laughs> I have pictures of you asleep just happen out there, to me, actually. Happened to me also, you know, but uh, like three weeks ago, I, I interviewed somebody at this time, and the guy in the first row fell asleep. So I told the guy next to him, can you wake him up? He looked at me and he said, you made him sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> Okay, tell us a little bit about the digital transformation, the WPP. We didn't say the WPP is the biggest uh, ad agency in the world, right? It is, yeah. How many, how many people are working? Uh, we have around 190,000 people around the world, yeah. 190,000 people around the world, not bad. How many countries? 114 countries. We just opened up in Cuba. So in that's Cuba, our latest market, yeah. Very nice. And uh, can you give us some names for, so the people know? Sure. What we so are no one knows wire and plastic products, but no, hopefully, but hopefully, people know companies like. Well, Eric was just on stage. who runs Cantar, which is our research and consulting division. Hopefully, people know companies like Ogilvy, J. Walter Thompson, Gray, Young and Rubicum. Uh, Group yeah, really, Mindshare. Really, really great names. AKQA. They, yeah, it goes on for a while. I could be here all day. So. Why do you have so many brands? Um, that's a good question. Well, it's, it's an interesting question because we're in the service industry, and if you look at other people in the service industry, like banks, consultants, lawyers, etc., they all have one brand, and they have what they call industry expertise. Um, in our business, for some reason, we're not allowed to have industry expertise. So if we have a client, if we work for um, an automotive client like Ford in one agency, then we can't work for Ford, we can't work for any of their competitors in that agency, so we need different agency structures. So that's one reason. And the other reason, we're a very creative business, um, not to say that 
banks and accountants aren't creative. They are. They often get into trouble for being they creative. Are. Yeah, they can be they too are. creative. Yeah. Um, but we're a creative business, and I think there's a perception in creative business, um, which is a strong perception, so it's essentially a reality that um, the bigger you get, the less creative you are. So I think there's do, a... Do you agree with that? I think... Um, I think scale can hamper creativity, so you have to be aware of it. I think if we merged all our agencies into one massive agency, I'm not sure that would be a, a smart idea. So that's another reason we have lots. Can you tell us, without disclosing too much, who are, give us some names of your customers so we know how sure, we'll I mean, be able to relate to it. Given the scale we have, we work for most of the world's leading brands, I guess. So our biggest customer is publicly known as Ford. Um, Ford. Other large customers, big consumer brands like Procter & Gamble, Unilever, L'Oreal. Um, we work for big tech companies. We work for the likes of Google, Microsoft, IBM, um, pretty much any category. Um, and also now increasingly work for big local companies. So some of the companies out there, Huawei is a huge client of ours globally, um, led out of Shenzhen in China. We have big Indian clients, big Indonesian clients. So. Um, it's a this good balance. trend is this trend of what you call this local and not so local anymore. Not so local, very much no, international. How, how many years this uh, this clientele since it began to be substantial? Well, I think um, I guess the traditional big clients for us have been global companies, which tend to be essentially based in U.S. or yeah, maybe General Europe. Motors, General yeah, Electric, exactly. General or Mills. some of the Europeans, well, the Nestles, the L'Oreal's. Um, but I guess it's probably in the past decade or so that we've seen um, some of the big local companies emerge beyond being local. So How do you explain this phenomenon? Well, I think the reason local companies are so successful locally is because they do a much better job of tapping into local culture and local consumers and understanding what people want. Um, and I think, you know, they're... But they then, then they go then and they get ambitions to, to go beyond their market. But you know, what we're seeing is some of the Chinese companies, rather than go off and try and conquer America, which is a tough thing to do, you know, they look for other markets where maybe they have relevance. So they, they're moving to um, other kind of fast growth markets with big consumer bases like Indonesia or Africa and places like that. So it doesn't necessarily mean you take the path that um, the, the So we see it with take. companies like Alibaba and Huawei. Yeah. <laughs> Many of the new Chinese companies, especially in the internet, are still zeroing on the domestic market. Yeah. What happened when they finish to, to execute against the domestic market and all of them begin to go public, uh, to, go, uh, to go out, out well, globally? I think the first point on that is the Chinese domestic market is obviously massive and still growing and still lots of opportunity there. So they don't necessarily need, to, certainly the internet companies don't necessarily need to be thinking um, outside of China. Um, but some of them are, Alibaba is, Tencent's making acquisitions in the US and other markets as well. Um, a little less so Baidu, although they have gone into the Middle East and Africa and some other markets. How many years well. you spent in uh, China? How many years? Yeah. I, sp I lived in Shanghai for seven years. Seven years. Yeah. Good. Uh, can I, will it be correct to say that the main segment of your clients, the main consumers of the brands you mentioned, are kind of the, the middle, middle income? Yeah, middle mid class. Middle yeah. class. Yeah. So this growth can be regarded as a proxy to the growth? Yeah, very much so. So I think the things we look for um, that drive our growth is essentially um, urbanization, so the trend of, of um, people moving to cities, and that really drives a greater middle class. So when you look at what's happened in places like China, across sub-Saharan Africa, and other places in the world which have been growing really fast, those are the two trends that have driven GDP growth and then driven our business growth as well, definitely, because then brands want to reach those consumers they become more competitive and they spend money to differentiate. So what we, what we witness in the last 10, 15 years is an immense growth of the middle class sure. in countries like China, India. Yeah. How about Latin America? Yeah, Latin America, Africa, um, Eastern Europe, um, definitely. And there's still a long way to go. I mean, you look at the macro trends, um, 
of the scale of middle class and that the definitions of middle class. I mean, in Africa, some people, there's a big report came out a couple of years ago defining the middle class, and they defined it as anyone who had um, a dollar of disposable income per day, which is obviously not a lot. No, I think, let me tell you how I define middle class. Middle no. class is anybody who can afford to buy branded toilet paper. Yeah, well, that, that would be a good way of describing it, yeah. And you know how we say, we say that the, the softness of the toilet paper and the softness of the currency are in inverse relations. <laughs> I, I can, I can didn't think that. about that one. <laughs> Let, let's talk a little bit about digital, digital, uh, digital advertising. Sure. Uh, roughly, what will be the percentage of uh, the income of the group from digital-related advertising vis-a-vis -vis um, non-digital? Non so, it's getting harder and harder to define what's digital and what's not nowadays. You can invent any number you want. Yeah, we, we just cannot make check it, it anyway. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> no, well, we do, we do report that number. So, I think this year um, we're looking at it's slightly above 30. It's about 32, 33%. 32, 33% yeah. digital. Yeah. Digital for WPP. And that's kind of in line with, um, if you look globally at the, um, the proportion of advertising dollars which are digital, it's around 30% in 2016. And how many, how it's divided by the, by the customers, the incumbent customers, you know, the old customers, how they gear their business to this kind of uh, change, of well, revolution? It, it's quite a, I mean, it differs by category, obviously. So there are categories where 100% of the budget is online, um, and there are categories which are still um, perhaps slower to adapt. So some of the consumer goods companies are, are definitely less than 30%. Um, but it has been a pretty... Um, aggressive change in the past, I guess, past decade, but if you go back 10 years, it was really very low single digits spent online. Um, and the big trend in our industry in the past decade has been that transition from um, traditional analog media to digital. And it's, and it's not a difficult thing to do when you have a huge marketing budget. You can't suddenly shift it. It has all sorts of implications for your company, the type of talent you have, and the way you measure things. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do. So how it's affect the traditional uh, medias like print and TV? Um, it's been difficult for them. I mean, actually, you know, we're, we are an agency model, a services model, so we sit in the middle, so that the key challenge for us is having the right talent and understanding the market and being able to service our clients. Um, the challenge for some of the traditional media companies is that their entire business model is founded on something which you know, is rapidly disappearing. So I think, um, you know, some of those traditional companies, especially ones in print media, have had a really tough time to adapt um, and probably haven't been quick enough and aggressive enough. And what's happened is you've seen kind of digital media startups establish themselves, um, become really strong brands and, and grab consumers' attention. And that makes it even harder for the traditional ones to transition their business over. So I think, you know, whether they will go out of business or not, that remains to be seen. But the glory days of many of these big traditional media companies are probably behind them. Can you, can you then relate the decline of the print paper to the rise of the toilet paper, or that too yeah, are you not connected? Pretty, yeah, we, are, we don't study the toilet paper yeah. industry that much. Maybe you should, you we know. We should, yeah. You know, did you, did you notice, you know, that when you buy toilet paper, you always try to see how it's soft. When you buy print, pr printing, printing, uh, newspaper, c computer paper, you never check how good it is. True, different use case, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, your, your colleague, Mr. Sir Martin Sorel, yeah. said a few months ago that uh, creative ad is being now replaced by, by uh, algorithmic, uh, by data. You, yeah. drive, you drive the business more on data, less, less on glossy, glossy pictures, et cetera, et cetera. Can you elaborate a little bit well, on it? Firstly, he was widely misquoted, which is often the case with Martin. But um, I think if you look at what's happened in, in that transition over to digital, there's been a lot of focus on data and the media side of the business. So, um, you know, the, the innovations that we've created in our industry have been very focused on the media side. So we're a lot better at targeting. If you think about what goes on with programmatic 
targeting and the ways you can define and target your audience. We've done a lot of optimization there. We're a lot more accurate than we ever were with traditional media in terms of targeting that message at the right person. So that's great, and we've done tons of innovation there. Um, and so that's been a priority, I guess, for us and for our, our industry. Um, but we're still very much in the creative industry because it's all very well targeting the message, but at the end of the day, what is that message? And that comes down to the creative work. So you need, you need the so tool. It's, it's definitely t both. And I think you know, one of the questions I always ask people is, like, what's your, what's your favorite ad that you remember in all What of your is life? your favorite ad? I'm not allowed to say. It's like choosing my favorite kid. I only have one kid, so that's easy. But, um, but yeah, I'm not really allowed to say that. But I do have a couple, I guess. Um, but when you ask people that question, literally, and I ask it to most people that I meet, I would say 99.8% of them come back to me with a TV ad. Really? No one ever says, I saw this awesome banner. It was like amazing. <laughs> it was just the best ad I've ever seen. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work to do on the creative side. And I think probably the one area of our industry that hasn't adapted so well to the digital side is the creative side. But there's huge opportunities there. And now we've kind of crack the media side, if you like, and the yeah, data I, side. I would like to suggest, you know, that every now and then we see, we see an, amazing, uh, an amazing video ad on the internet also. True. But p people maybe don't, not, don't want banners, but they want stories. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the um, video advertising is a great medium. And obviously, it's different online. You have a lot shorter time to grab people's attention and get the message across. But when you have video, you have sound, you have moving image, it's, um, it's a very um, great media to, to grab people's let's, attention. Let's talk about the consumer. All right. OK, about the age of the consumer. Yeah. What can you tell us? What are your, your insight, the WPP insight, about who is the consumer? Well, it depends on the brand, obviously. I mean, OK. So consumers live a lot longer nowadays. We all, we all um, live longer. So um, there are you know, broader definitions of what a consumer is. Um, but most clients, whether it's right or wrong, tend to go for that kind of younger audience. And um, they leave people like me cold in yeah, the well, people like me in the dark. Well. Yeah. No, you Which are is a kid. crazy because all the spending power is sat on my left. Yeah, right? so I you know I have only very little time to spend. So I, I now spend like crazy and you guys are giving up on me. No well that's it is crazy. But um, I think one of the challenges in our industry is that the younger audiences are getting harder and harder to reach. So yeah. you How many years do you still give me that I will be able to spend? How many what, sorry? Years, years. How many years I give you? Yeah. What, left? You're going to live forever, Yossi. <laughs> I'm retiring before you do. <laughs> you're still young at heart as well, so yeah. that's what counts. I'm sure, you're, I'm sure all the, I bet you're on Snapchat, right? That's, wh that's where all the kids are now. That's where all the brands are trying to reach No, no, them. I'm only on, on uh, email because if I stick my nose, I get so much spam <laughs> that I walk away from uh, all, right, all the other awesome. medias. You're not on ICQ anymore? No, some, some, some guy, I don't want to say from which country, stole my number. I had 55555. Five, five, five. It was stolen like 16 years ago, and since then I'm off. Never. OK. See, well, you're hard to reach, huh? You're not even on any of those platforms. So again, let's talk about the, the, the consumer. Yeah. So you say the old consumers have more money to, to spend. The young consumer is the one, is the holy grail that everybody is trying to reach him. So where are you, the professionals, guiding your clients? Well, I, I think you know, it depends on the brand, right? So there are obviously brands that target um, different demographics, whether it's gender, whether it's um, uh, age. Um, so really, it's very hard to say there is one consumer, because yeah, there's definitely okay, not one sure. brand. So. We spoke a little bit about the, the traditional media properties, all of them are trying frantically to move to digital. Yeah. If you have to give kind bird view of what's going on in the space, how, how successful they are doing it? Uh, is it going to be in five years a world of Google and Facebook and that is, or we will, see here, we will see here and there some survivors? No, there's going to be survivors, so it's not like, um, it's not a binary thing, I don't think. It's not like what, you know, 
certainly Google and Facebook are, um, have already established themselves. I mean, one of the interesting things about media is it's not really a global industry. Most of the big media companies are very strong in their domestic market, maybe a couple of other markets, but they're not really global. Whereas Google and Facebook are in every market in the world pretty much apart from China. Um, so they are big global companies that have established themselves. Um, but they don't create any content, right? So the other media companies are creating content. Um, and I think you will see some of them adapt and survive. I, again, I think maybe their glory days are behind them, but they're not going to disappear. Um, and they will make acquisitions as well. They already are. They're making substantial investments and in acquisitions. Yeah, That's I just read today that uh, Time is looking to buy Yahoo. He's one of the yeah. contenders. Those are two challenged companies, let's say. But um, yeah, I think, I think investing and acquiring new brands is definitely one of the routes that they're going to have to take because establishing them organically is difficult to do. It's expensive. It's risky. And it's kind of already a bit late because the popular brands are already there. So Google and Facebook are going to control the world? They already do. Yeah. They already do. Why do they need the uh, advertising agencies to be between them and their advertisers? Well, I think they look at our model. I think a few years back, they probably thought that themselves. Um, but they look at our model. I mean, if you look at Google and Facebook, they're sat there growing pretty dramatically. They make 60 70% margin. They hire a few people, but they grow like crazy. You look at our model, we're in the service industry. We, you know, I'm not going to plead poverty. We, we do pretty well, but our margin's around 14%, 15%. And our business is not scalable in that if our revenue scale, our cost scale, and our people scale as well. And they look at us, and they don't really want to be in that business. They want to be valued as tech companies, and they want to be scalable, hire less people, and make more money. So I think they're willing to let us do all the hard work, and they'll just sit there and keep earning money, which they're quite good at. So. Tell me, where do you see the Baidu's of the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Google and the Facebook? Well, I think, I mean, obviously, China is a very protected market. So there's clearly an argument that Baidu's and of this world wouldn't be there if China was an open market and allowed um, free access to companies like Google and Facebook. Yeah, I'm not so sure. I think. Um, Clearly, China's not just a closed market. It's, it's also quite a different market. Um, and local companies in all sectors there have done very well, whether the sector's open or closed. Um, but I think they will, they will struggle to take their businesses outside of China. So I think the only way they're going to do that really is through acquisition. And you see certainly Alibaba being very aggressive on acquisitions. Um, so I think they're if they want to <laughs> succeed outside of China, they're going to have to acquire companies. So in a few years, we may have a Chinese shareholder for WPP? We already have a, a very major Chinese shareholder in WPP. Yeah. One of our top shareholders is the um, Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund. And one of our other top shareholders is the Singaporean Sovereign Wealth Fund. Oh. So we, uh, we have lots of Asian shareholders. Very good. So. The center of gravity is moving to Asia. I think it already moved, yeah. This is why you live in Singapore. I moved, <laughs> yeah. You took precautions. Yeah, well, I figured, where do you want to be the next 40 years? Probably out here, right? Weather's good. Yeah, are you going to Cannes in? Uh, um, yes, I will be going. What to should we expect? What news we should expect in the advertising industry? Well, I what think are the new things? What are the Cannes new is trends? a tough place to break news because everyone tries to no. um, shout and scream there. But the basis of Cannes, going back to your earlier question, is really it's, a, it's, a, it's an award ceremony and a conference for our industry, but it's all around creativity. It's the, it's the awards that celebrate creativity. Um, so at the end of the day, never mind what is the media. People just would like to get a good story. I think so, yeah. I mean, the media allows us to tell that story to the right people at the right time, and it, it's really important. But if you don't have a story, then there's no okay. point having great Let's media. spend, we have uh, less than three minutes. Let's talk a little bit about innovation in WPP. About my what? About innovation. Innovation in WPP. The I word, you know, yeah. I and then, and, and. how you guys innovate in WTT, WPP, and more important, there are here at least 20 guys with great ideas 
sure. about new things in advertising that you guys never thought about it and you will never think about I'm it. I'm sure there's more than 20. How you reach out to them, how they reach out to you. So we, we obviously have quite a broad structure at WPP. We have many agencies, some of which we talked about before. Um, so there are many entry points into the group. You can come in via one of those agencies. You can come in via WPP. Um, we make uh, a lot of acquisitions in, in the market, so we're always buying new agencies uh, in different markets and different disciplines. We also make a lot of investments, so we have a pretty strong uh, venture portfolio, and we're always open to approaches on that. So I think hopefully we're an approachable group, many routes in, uh, and you know, we, we certainly don't believe that we have all the answers, so we're always out there looking um, for new areas of opportunity. Are you willing to share your email with these fine people? My email is scott.spirit at wpp.com. scott.spirit at wpp.com. If um, you have any idea... And I never get any emails, so I'd welcome... You never get any emails? I'd welcome lots you of You never emails. get any emails, you never answer any emails. No, I get, I get a few. I get a few. So and if you guys them. have an idea to how to change the world of advertising... Absolutely. Scott is your man. I, well, I would, yeah, I'll try. What are you going to do in the next few years in your capacity of CD CDO? Yeah. So I think the focus for my role is around creating differentiation for WPP. So what can we do with our partners, with the Googles and Facebooks of this world, which is truly differentiating for us, and we can take to our clients and say, hey, you need to be with WPP because of this. And so we have a few things. We're, we're going to actually announce a couple of things in CAN. Um, and we have got a lot of stuff going on at the moment with, with all of our big digital partners to try and achieve that. Um, but really, that's my singular focus. What can we do that differentiates us from our competition? Good. Unfortunately, time is running out. Seems we can like. continue for another 10 minutes like this. Scott, really, uh, you gave us a lot of insights. And uh, it was a pleasure to interview you. And I'm looking forward to another opportunity to grill you harder. Uh, so ladies I'm and gentlemen, Scott too, Spirit, thank you thank very, you very, very much. much. Thank you.